Okay, let's talk about regionalism as a feature of modernism. There was a time when nearly all canonical literature was set in large urban centers like London, Paris, New York, and Boston. With several notable exceptions from authors like Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charles Dickens, and Victor Hugo, 19th century protagonists were white, educated if they were men, at least moderately wealthy, and if they lived in the country, they lived in high-class country estates. However, in the 20th century, more novels were being set in small towns and among minority communities. That trend is called regionalism. They come from different regions. And it's one facet of modernism. In Great Britain, for example, Mary Webb set her novels in rural Shropshire in the West Midlands. James Joyce wrote about Dublin, Ireland. Across the Channel in France in the 1920s, there was a surge of literature in non-French languages like Breton and Basque. An example of Spanish modernisme is Prudenci Bertrana, who wrote in Catalan as opposed to Spanish. In China, I believe there was a movement in the 1930s to move away from classical Chinese towards a more down-to-earth language spoken by people outside the center of culture. But... I must admit, I'm not as knowledgeable about world literature as I'd like. But regionalism is primarily thought of as a North American movement, and I do know a bit about that. Regionalism was largely a reaction to the Great Depression, although really it was already starting to happen at the turn of the century. After the stock market crash in 1929 and the world plunged into a global economic depression, the centers of power lay in ruins, you might say giving voices from outside the mainstream a chance to be heard. It was like during the pandemic, when big cities came to a halt, and you could hear birds again. Writers from small towns far from the big cities began being published. William Faulkner wrote about people in Mississippi in books like The Sound and the Fury. Sarah O'Jewett set her stories in the Northeast, but in the rural parts of Maine. Lula Grace Erdman published a novel in 1929, The Cabin, set in frontier Texas. Twenty years later, Erdman published a better-known book, The Wind Blows Free, also set in frontier Texas. Jack London wrote about gold prospectors and sled dogs in the Alaskan Klondike and the Yukon in northern Canada, as well as California and Hawaii. This well-known collection of short stories by Sherwood Anderson was set in a small town in Ohio, obviously. Sinclair Lewis wrote about conservative, middle-class people in Minnesota. Upton Sinclair wrote a searing novel about the harsh working conditions of exploited immigrants and unsanitary practices of the meatpacking district of Chicago. The people were poor and the settings were ugly. Couldn't be more different from the Ivy League universities of New England. This popular 1930 detective novel was set in San Francisco, California. It was later made into one of my favorite movies. In Canada of the 1920s and 30s, there were Frederick Philip Grove's pioneer novels set in the unforgiving prairies of Manitoba. Non-white voices began being heard for the first time. In 1912, for example, Sui Sin Far, whose father was a white Englishman but whose mother was from Shanghai, China, wrote about the daily lives of Chinese Americans in Seattle and San Francisco. In 1921, Zit Kalashah published Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians about corporations defrauding Osage people to get their land, on which oil had been found. No surprise there. In 1937, Zora Neale Hurston, who was part of the Harlem Renaissance, wrote the now classic Their Eyes Were Watching God, and those black rural characters talked the way they really would have. And after World War II, the world saw the publication of Pocho by José Antonio Villarreal. Pocho was a derogatory word used by Mexicans to describe an assimilated Mexican-American. Please do not use that word. Besides being derogatory, it's fallen out of usage and no one would understand you. In the world of visual art, Grant Wood's American Gothic is a good example of regionalism. Rather than depict a figure from European mythology or an important person from high society, Wood painted ordinary, hard-working farmers. Regionalism is often associated with realism. Check out my video on that topic. Another regionalist painter was John Stuart Curry. His paintings were not realistic. 
This well-known Curry painting features a towering John Brown, who was a militant abolitionist, at the start of the Civil War in what was called Bleeding Kansas. Ask your teacher about him. In the world of music, audiences began discovering American folk music. The blues, Tejano, as well as Cajun and Zydeco music. Country music started laying down its foundation, too, with artists like Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. That's regionalism, too. In the time I've been alive, I've seen the literary and art worlds become more and more diverse every decade, and it's wonderful. I love seeing cultures that are new to me through the eyes of people who actually lived in them. Even though I wasn't actually around in the 1930s, regionalism is a part of that very American movement towards inclusiveness that we see today. There's a good chance that art that is considered outside the mainstream today will be considered classics in the future. Think about that. Okay, well that's regionalism. Regionalism.